the terror is part of the killing. It's you. We're coming. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but soon. You will have bones broken, joints dislocated, and then the pain starts. Your tongue is pierced with the fangs of a snake. Your anal cavity is ripped out. Your stomach compressed until the sphincter muscle emerges and is cut away. Plant material is rammed into the gut to start the process of autodigestion. You will be dead in three or four days, you hope. Your killers, Kanaima shamans from the Guyana Highlands, come to your grave. This fuzzy photograph shows one. They drive a hollow cane through the ground into your stomach and suck on the juices. If they taste the sweetness of honey, they dig you up, taking bones and flesh as talismans for their dark work. My own work with shamans and shamanism is, thankfully, less gory. This is Luba, the Buryat shaman I studied with in Siberia. The nearest we got to gore was the traditional offering of freshly butchered sheep carcass to the spirits. What I do is to use a shamanic worldview to interpret and explain the past. We'll return to the Kanaimish later, but let me give you a few examples to show you what I mean. We all know that there are certain commonalities of shamanism, aspects of ritual and magic that appear similar or even the same across vast distances. While some may have been taken around the globe with the modern human exodus in the Paleolithic, this always seems to me an unsatisfactory position. What I do is to match these commonalities with the neuropsychological experiences of trance, something that studies show is almost universal among non-industrialized people. Some aspects of our ritual and beliefs are so ingrained that they can be taken for granted. For example, the afterlife. I think it's fair to make a generalization that most humans accept the concept of an afterlife. But why? Where's the empirical proof? The afterlife did not just appear in human thought. There was a process behind it. I think this process started with trance, or more accurately, with dreams. All higher order mammals dream. We remember ours, and when you stop and think about a specific dream, they feel extremely real. Almost like another world we enter as we sleep. You can see where I'm going with this. The sensation is the same for a non-sleeping trance. You go somewhere else. But let's go back to the neuropsychological sensation. Because certain neurons that are fired during trance have a circling tendency, entry to this other world is often via a tunnel. It is striking that those undergoing near-death experiences speak of a tunnel leading to another realm. The Buddhist caves at Kizil in Xinjiang, China, are linked with long winding tunnels leading to large spaces filled with images of the spiritual other world. We can also see this in archaeology. Cave art, which may double for the other world itself, is reached via long and winding tunnels. Inaccessibility seems part of the journey. And, as we've seen earlier, passage tombs leading to the place of the afterlife were long and dark. Once someone arrives in the other world, they often see other beings. Animals feature prominently, as they do in cave art, and it's no surprise that zoopsia, the hallucination of animals, is the commonest form of vision. As anyone who has meditated knows, and this is another way of entering trance, that after a while the body starts to float, the shamanic ecstasy of Murcia Eliade's work. And we externalise our body, and moreover, our mind. By this time we are probably hallucinating animals, so it is a small step to attribute our externalised mind 
to the animal in front of us. This is the reason so many shamanic people speak of animal guides and helpers, the spirits of the other world, the Nargual jaguar of Central America, the antlered mother deer among the Kyrgyz, which may date back beyond the Scythian image shown here, and the humble weasel among the Yokut of California. In prehistory, we may look to the human-like beluga carvings of Lipinski Veer, the fox fur armband on Lindo Man, and the pervading prevalence of the feathered serpent in Noachl, called Quetzalcoatl, throughout Mayan culture. So, we've arrived at the shamanic triumvirate of journeying via a tunnel to reach another world that is inhabited by animal spirits. We can see it in present-day shamanic communities, in the ancient past, and also in the neuropsychological experiences of trance. Of course, the specialist who undertakes these journeys is a shaman, but I did not think that she or he needed any introduction today. But it's important to say that all members of a community will share the same shamanic-based worldview, might even enter trance. In my work among the Sami of Lapland, all household heads used to drum themselves into trance, and they will understand the world according to the shamanic tenets. At this stage in a talk on shamanism, I usually make the point, especially to a non-specialist audience, that shamans work for the benefit of their community. I would not necessarily start with an exposition on the Kanema. But my topic today is dark shamanism and the morality of violence to achieve one's end. Take the Kakas shamans from the Altai region of southern Siberia. These shamans steal the souls of children, leaving them devoid of life so they eventually die. But they use these stolen souls to help their own patients recover from illness. Often, communities with sickening children employ the services of another shaman to steal the child's soul back again, necessarily inflicting harm on the person who relies on it to heal. Now, how do you untangle the morality of that? Toba shamans from Argentina believe the power is a finite resource and they must battle other shamans for it by throwing rays of light to deplete an opponent's power. To be able to heal more illness within a community, the shaman needs to gain as much power as she or he is able to. And yet, this always has the effect of leaving another shaman depleted of power and less able to heal. Among the Yucca communities of California, if people felt a shaman was malicious, they called a hiatu or shaman killer to rid them of the dark presence. The hiatu relies upon hawk as a spirit guide and wields incredible power, which people accept is used for good, even though it brings about the death of another. Morality, at least from our perspective, is not easy to discern here. Shamanic work, often geared towards healing with a community, seems couched in violence, be it mutilating others, killing children or fighting each other with rays of light. The shaman from Ecuador, shown here, is whipping a patient with stinging nettles as part of a healing. Violence is the underbelly of what we might like to think of as a positive and affirming tradition. But why is violence so often at the heart of shamanism? Is there a neuropsychological explanation? I think you can probably guess there are, there is. I spoke earlier about a sense in trance that our bodies float and become externalized, the self disintegrating. It is not dissimilar to being dismembered and this to prove the point, many Siberian shamans speak of being dismembered by the spirits when they first encounter the other world. Russian academic Vilmos Doisegi wrote of the initiation of a Siberian shaman who was cut up and boiled by the spirits, his limbs placed in a huge cauldron. 
It is difficult to hear that and not to think of Bull Rock Cave in the Czech Republic, where 40 Iron Age individuals, mostly women, had been dismembered in a cavern. I think this reconstruction is mainly for tourists. But at the centre of the remains was a cauldron. Trance can also stimulate the amygdala, bundles of brain neurons responsible for an orientating response when someone moves it in an exaggerated manner. Such as Siberian shamans, who often drum themselves into a frenzy of movement. This can elucidate a fear response, which may heighten the expectation of violence. We can find this expectation of violence in many world religions. Catholic Christians who die may face torment in hell, or at least a spell in the unpleasantness of purgatory. I don't need to elucidate on the medieval stories of the torments of the flesh that await. It all feels quite shamanic. In Buddhism, chart is a practice that invites dismemberment. The word actually means to sever. Even in ancient religions, uh, such as that of Egypt, Amut, a demon who was part lion, hippopotamus and crocodile, awaited those who fail the scales of Osiris and the weighing of the heart. Anyone who falls to Emmet dies a second death and is completely annihilated from existence. The same motif is probably behind the dismemberment inflicted by the Kanaima shamans, an expectation that violence is part of the process of death and journey to the other world. It's almost as if without the actuality, or at least the threat of violence, entry to the other world cannot be. Do we see this in the past? Well, as we've seen earlier, we do. The Paleolithic boy from Sungir in Russia had 250 fox teeth in a belt around his waist. That was a lot of teeth, and analysis shows that it would have required 63 foxes to provide them all. Moreover, extracting the teeth is a brutal and bloody process. They don't just fall out. The gums need to be cut and peeled back to reach the root of the tooth. The boy was wearing the manifestation of violence around his waist. Did this help him journey to the afterlife? Or was it something he wore in life? The violence meted out to the foxes, somehow pulling their shamanic power close. We've already met the human-like beluga from Mesolithic Lipinski Vir. Clubs in the fish-orientated settlement, reconstructed here, carried images of the fish, presumably used for dispatching those that were caught. But the sculptures suggest the relationship is deeper, more spiritually charged. The people eschewed other food, even causing malnutrition to their children. What was it about these fish? Maybe that they were known to be docile when caught, seemingly giving themselves to people willingly, accepting the violence meted out to them. Many traditional hunters believe the animals themselves, or an animal mistress or master, provides the prey for them to hunt giving their lives to sustain the humans. The jewel is from Tilyatepe in Afghanistan, much later in date, but the same concept. The violence is thereby institutionalized and accepted both by hunter and prey. The beluga acquiesced. At Deer Island between Finland and Russia, beaver was hunted and given special prominence in burials with beaver teeth buried with females. Beavers also go docile when they are caught, seemingly acquiescing to a violent death. The Neolithic saw a gradual change in people's attitude to the dead, a move from sealed long mounds with a body preserved under tons of earth, to an open communal tomb with separate chambers providing for processing the mortal remains. This is a schematic showing West Kennet in Wiltshire, but you've seen other examples in Aaron's paper earlier. It is possible that entire corpses were placed in the entrance passageways 
or even left outside of the tomb where they would putrefy and rot. When the remains started to fall apart, certain bones might be torn away and used for ceremonies or curated and worn as talismans of the dead. It was a potentially brutal and violent process of dismemberment, albeit possibly carried out with respect. As the bones hardened and lost all resemblance of flesh, some were returned to the tomb to be sorted and stacked with matching bones that already lay in the far depths of the chamber. Okay, probably not quite like this, but was it respect? Or was it a literal means of metaphorically ordering the dead and controlling them in the afterlife? A battle over land rights, perhaps, the dead being ordered and then disappearing as settlements of the living became more established through generations. In the Bronze Age, weapon deposits in rivers are often broken and smashed. This is not an easy thing to achieve. Swords do not readily snap without great force. Analysis shows that breaking a weapon prior to deposit required a frenzy of violence. Sparks would fly, and possibly this was the point of the ritual. Like humans, weapons were also dismembered before being passed to the other world through the veil of the water. Excessive violence accompanied, maybe even hastened this departure. And as if to emphasize further the destructive process, selected human remains were sometimes left with the weapons. It is telling for our focus on violence that decapitated heads are the most common part recovered. We even see such excessive violence meted out to Iron Age and Roman period people, as evidenced by the remains found in bogs. Take Lindo Mann, who we've met before. From painstaking research into his remains, we can reconstruct what might, and I stress might, have been his fate. Perhaps the man stood naked, but for his fox fur armband, a symbol of his animal spirit. He did not struggle. Indeed, he stood quite calmly at the edge of the water, as if this was his doing, his choice to die. Like the animals earlier, he acquiesced to his fate. He bent his neck for the garrote to be wrapped around his neck. The knot that would end his life was pulled tight around his throat. As the cord ducked deep, the man tensed, his back arching wildly and his protruding tongue turning black. Still the cord was tightened so that the man had to gasp for the last breath he would take. At the moment it seemed certain he would die, a knife flashed across the sky and his throat was slashed from one ear to the other. Blood under pressure from the tightening garrote erupted like a stream in spate and its thickness splattered the ground with gore. The man's legs gave out as death finally claimed him. He was bludgeoned, bits of skull piercing his brain, just to make sure. But then his fall was checked, and he was laid gently to rest. The violence was excessive, but an integral part of the death, or maybe we should say sacrifice. Like all our examples, violence, particularly when taken to excess, creates a spectacle. But it may also be intimately associated in people's minds with the passage to the other world. This applies to material objects such as the weapons, animals such as prey species and those utilised for symbolic decoration, and even humans. Imagine witnessing such a scene. It would stay with you. Violence, particularly when taken to excess, associates an act or even an individual with the other world. To go there, violence is a self-fulfilling risk. Shamans take this risk. A Mapuche initiate from southern Chile has negative energy removed by an experienced shaman by violently sucking on her breast, belly and head, usually with enough force to draw blood. The fingers and lips are also cut with white quartz. Taman initiates from Borneo find their fingers pierced with fishing hooks during initiation. 
Experienced shamans embed these deep in the flesh to enable the initiate to feel and remove spirit intrusions from future patients. They also peer the outer eye tissue on the physical body to enable them to see the spirits. These privations on the body mirror what the spirits do to the body in the other world. It is a means of making the act real, a form of ritual theatre. Perhaps it makes the stage of the Kunaima shamans less tainted as a result. We must not ignore the darkness of shamanism or try to impose a modern morality onto its practitioners. The worldview of shamanism accepted, even encouraged violence, as part of the process of accessing the other world and utilising the power offered by the spirits that reside there. These images show a shamanic healing, and perhaps I should repeat, healing from Kazakhstan. And oh yes, that's a sheep lung that she's bashing him with. Now she is hitting them with a fist to remove malignant spirits. This is a kerban taken from an Islamic ritual when people sit under a sheep whilst the shaman slits its throat. Again, it's good for healing. Violence may have arisen from the neuropsychology of trance experience, but it has become rooted in tradition and belief throughout the world and seemingly throughout time. Thank you.